right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's Business Builders Weekly Call. So do me a favor before we jump in and we start unpacking all the value, a couple of housekeeping things. One, we want this to be interactive. So don't uh, don't feel that you have to stay there and be quiet. Uh, you can ask questions. Uh, there's a couple easy ways to do that. Really, one key way is keep yourself muted uh, during the call. But if, if you have a question or comment, just hit that hand raise uh, icon right at the down, down at the bottom of the menu, and that'll let us know you got a question. Uh, and we'll probably have folks popping on here uh, throughout the call. And the second thing is, because we want it to be interactive, we want to see your beautiful faces, uh, turn your cameras on uh, unless you are in an awkward place where uh, it would be less appropriate to do that. <laughs> we invite you to turn the camera on. Yeah, even if you're driving, I uh, would love to see you and be able to interact with you. And then um, we're going to dive in. The goal of this call this week and every single week is that you're leaving with more actionable strategies. Uh, you're not just listening to us talk on the call, but the format of these calls be really, uh, really simple. We'll give some training for the first 20 minutes or so to really lay the context for what we're talking about. We have a whole curriculum that is built out for these calls every single quarter. Uh, so this quarter is really uh, laying the foundation of core concepts. So we're in Q4 this year. And for all of us, uh, including all two partners, we're all preparing to just dominate and crush it in 2025. That means we got to make sure the foundation is strong, make sure we fortify, make sure we're prepared. And for some of you that are here now that are, are going to watch the replay of this, your business may be uh, more e-commerce driven or online sales. Q4 is 80% of your revenue. So people are in the uh, money, the the mode to, to spend money, uh, especially in Q4. So you want to make sure that you're taking advantage of that and capturing people when, when they're in that buying state. So let's kick it off here. Uh, today's uh, training is going to be on one of the really the cornerstone uh, foundational core concept of all two partners. And that's the four stages of the business growth cycle. Every business goes through these stages. And the reason this is so important is if you don't know what these stages are, if you don't know how uh, they, the, the sequence of them and how to recognize which one your business is in, you could be spending and likely are spending a lot of time working on the wrong things uh, that, and I'd say that not the wrong things in that they are, you shouldn't be doing them, but wrong is in the timing. They're the right things at the wrong time. And the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. So we want to make sure you're doing the right things at the right time. Uh, so we're going to dive into that. This is going to be really good. Uh, we we have a worksheet for everyone. We'll drop that. Uh, Kirk will drop that in the uh, in the chat here in a minute uh, once we get to dive into the training. So for you guys that are driving, don't worry about looking at it because you'll have the, the link. And then we'll send it out via email after the call also. So this is the worksheet for tonight. Uh, it's really simple. It's just to follow along. There's no math questions. There's no algebra. Um, I'm not meaning like that. Uh, but it's just simple to, to guide your thoughts, help you take notes on it, and then a few key action items. So we're going to dive into to this. Uh, but before we do, I want to just have you look at this. This is the, the growth stages. This is the four stages of the business growth cycle. And we're going to walk through this in detail. And then, like I said, this can be interactive. So if you guys have questions uh, as we're going through it, I want you to, to feel comfortable asking those questions. Uh, so feel free to chime in. But what I want you to do is recognize where you're at, number one. And then number two, what, what are the steps for you to move to the next phase? Because this is both a cycle that your business goes through, but it's also a cycle that you engage in uh, when you're launching products, you're launching services. So... There's multiple layers to it. So we're going to walk through uh, this now. So I'll leave, the, I'll actually leave this up because I know some of you guys are, does everyone have it pulled up already? You didn't have a trouble opening the link? Okay, perfect. So I'll turn that off then. So the All True team, we've, prior to building the All True team, uh, we had all been working together and we launched All True Partners because we saw just some common things that were happening in business and a lot of opportunities, but a lot, also a lot of struggles. And one of the, the core driving concepts for us or truths that we, we know to be um, evident in every business is that as a business owner, you don't know everything. You don't know every aspect of business in general, but even of your business. 
And so you hire people, the right people to come into your business, come alongside your business in our case, and help you grow and fill in some of the gaps of the areas where uh, you don't have certain skill sets. So if you're not a marketer, you pull someone in for that. Uh, if you're not great at administration, you pull someone in for that. Um, at a certain level, you shouldn't be managing your own finances and bookkeeping, so you pull someone in for that. One of the thing, the reasons you do that is because as a business owner, what you're great at, what you excel at, is the thing that you sell. So uh, I know the Mintons, you guys are doing conversion rate optimization, building a, a high converting landing pages, websites. Uh, you're working on the Altru site right now, which is looking very good, by the way. I looked at the uh, uh, the draft of the homepage and it's coming along very nicely. So we're excited about that. Uh, so we'll definitely be giving feedback for you guys. But you do great work on that and that's what you're good at. Um, the Wyman's, you guys are phenomenal when it comes to all things plumbing and mechanical, uh, trenchless, all of that for residential commercial. What we're good at in the Altru team is we're good at growing businesses within our respective skill sets. So marketing and sales, finance and accounting, operations, strategic HR. And part of that is when you recognize that, you start to take a different perspective at your, in your business. One of our goals is to help business owners move from the owner operator phase to the true business leader phase where you're no longer working in your business, but you're working on your business. And part of that is recognizing where you're at in this cycle. So as we dive into this, start to ask yourself the questions. There's questions in the worksheet, but start to ask yourself these questions about where you're at and what actions you specific for your business need to take. I'll give some examples as we go through this, but you may think of uh, other ones that are uh, additional uh, insights or questions you should be asking. And then the rest of the All True team is here, uh, the rest of the partners. So they all call on them to give additional insight or they may just pipe in and, and interrupt uh, to give their additional insights. So the first stage, when we look at the cycle of growing businesses, and we've done this, I mean, I've been consulting businesses for over 10 years, um, and actually all of us, uh, for at least a decade, with respect to our individual skill sets, have been consulting businesses. And in the last two, three years, uh, we've trained over 3,000, uh, managed a $250 million portfolio of businesses, and then uh, we're in positions where we were responsible for oversight of the teams that were managing uh, a little over 600 million in uh, annual revenue through all the businesses that were in uh, the overall portfolio. And when we look back, we recognize businesses are in one of these four stages. So the first stage is the foundation stage. This is the stage where you're really laying the, the foundational uh, groundwork for your business. This is where you're you're focused on uh, the, the essential things. Now, every business goes through this phase, whether they realize they're doing it or not, because without this phase, you don't have a business. This is where you are developing your, um, you're laying the groundwork for future growth. You're developing your core functions, uh, your core offers, your core value proposition, and you're building the operational systems, the basic systems you need. And here's one of the amazing thing, amazing things we've seen is you can, depending on your industry, you can build a multi-million dollar business. And I've seen businesses that were even 10, $15 million, uh, typically in really high uh, revenue industries or verticals like construction, where they're, they had the basics of the foundation. So they had those core functions. I can't, you got your finance, sales, operations. They had defined somewhat of a value proposition, although it was extremely lacking, not super clear, either too few offers or too many offers or just unclear offers. And then they had their basic operational systems. When we sell it, it goes to this stage, here's how we deliver, et cetera. But what we found was that so many businesses, where they get to a certain peak of revenue and then they start to plateau and they start to decline. And the reason why, when they're between the foundation and the fortification stage, is that they're missing key elements in the foundation. So on, on the, I'll talk to the marketing and sales side. They have a value proposition that is directed at getting new customers, but they have nothing that's directed at expanding their brand to continue to build that audience that brings more people in. And I actually want to ask the, the rest of the 
partners to speak to their specific uh, function? And what are some of the foundational things that tend to be missing within HR, finance, accounting operations? I'll jump in. Um, a lot of times what I find uh, that's missing is truly the foundation, which is the mission, vision, core values. Whether it's something that they've put together or they've not even touched because it's it doesn't generate revenue, um, it's often either overlooked or underdeveloped or not even rolled out to the team. So my my first question to all of our clients as they're doing their onboarding is, What's your mission? If you can't tell me your mission, and neither can your people, and if people don't know why they're showing up or what happens when they show up, we can't expect them to show up for us on on a consistent basis with any sort of purpose. And we'll we'll kick it over to to Heather. Okay. 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 Okay, from an operations and accounting perspective, a lot of times business owners, for one, they have either too many processes or no processes documented. Another thing I've seen is that their processes have 20 exceptions to the rule, which means that there really is no true process. And so typically you can see business owners saying, hey, I have five ways to invoice my invoice and it depends on who the client is. It depends what we sell and depends on what we sell it for. And there's a lot of customizations happening from the jump that should never happen from the jump Um, because foundational pieces don't have customizations. They have standards. And then as you grow and scale your business, that's when customizations can come in from an operations perspective. Go ahead. Can you guys hear her now? You can hear me now. Sweet. Let's try this. Uh, so that's hopefully you guys heard the back end of that. So from an operations perspective, too much customization on the front end. From an accounting perspective, oftentimes it's the lack of structure that people have on their foundations, meaning that when they go to bill, they don't have their products have no product. Uh, there's no revenue streams. There's no product names, types, classes. Their costs have no department. So there really is no data structure that's there so that when you go to bill your budget, you don't know how to really truly budget because you don't have to book any classes or any revenue into the appropriate resume. You haven't booked any costs or revenue into the appropriate buckets. So it makes it seem like all everything is just bunched together. Of course, if you create structure in the front end, you, uh, I know it sounds really simple, but just making sure your chart of accounts are in alignment, that they're actually, you can see assets, then you can see your equity, you can see your, your, your profit uh, and loss statement. And it's not just a bunch of repetitive accounts, but you're utilizing classes and departments for a lot of the structure. Um, to, again, set the foundation for being able to grow and scale when you guys, when the budget season comes or even reforecasting comes. The other piece of it is more, again, I think I touched on this before, but the data pieces. Um, again, from, uh, marketing, finance, accounting, they all speak different languages in terms of how much detail they want in their data. And oftentimes when it comes to data, you end up having just small nuances that are different. For instance, I have 415 North versus 415N. Those don't seem like a big deal, but when you're trying to clean your data and you're going from a system um, implementation and that you go from QuickBooks to like NetSuite or even change your CRM, those uh, small differences create habit when you're trying to be able to uh, create a systemized data structure for your your team. And Tim, the mic is yours. I think Heather uh, spelled it out perfectly. If you don't have if you don't have a good accounting foundation or really an operational foundation, you certainly won't have a very good finance foundation. Because again, the role of finance is to take the three languages, operations and accounting, and really project into the future. And if you're basing your projections off of entertaining data points where there isn't consistency in the data, um, your projections are off-putting. And so from a foundational element, oftentimes what we see with clients is they don't have an accounting stakeholder that truly owns the data itself. Right? They may be doing the transactions, but they don't own clear and concise data. And because they don't own clear and concise data, we don't get good data. 
And since you don't have good data, you also don't have very good projections. And so ultimately when they come and work with Ultrue, one of the first things we do is we go through the data itself at the general ledger level if we need to, and we identify how can we clean up the data in the most, uh, in, in the easiest manner possible so that we can at least do minor projections at a consolidated level so that we can build out some level of unit metrics. Because when we get into unit metrics, then we can identify what are we doing operationally? What do we sell? How much do we sell it for? What does it cost us to deliver? What's our profit per whatever we're delivering? And from there, we can build the basis of what is a projection business model. And now we get to have more entertaining conversations of what is our revenue targets? More importantly, what are our net free cash flow targets? What do we want to take out of the business? What do we want to take home in salary or distributions? And through, from there, we build out our targets and then we communicate that to the operations. So ultimately, from a foundational element, we're looking at our data, the structure of our data, the three languages, operationally, accounting, and financial, are all about the data structure. And then we use that data structure so we can tell the story of what are we trying to accomplish? What are our targets? And oftentimes, the first start, starting point is just doing that audit. What do we have? Awesome. So the key actions that you guys can take from here and this is notated in the um, in the worksheet, is one, do a business audit. Look at your systems. And a specific to answer the question, like how do you look at your system? What are you looking for? To keep it really simple, two things, data and communication. Is data being tracked and shared? And is it accessible to the people who need access to that data? So all your key stakeholders, anyone who is overseeing a key function of the business. And then two, communication. Can you communicate with one another what, between across functions, not between functions, but across functions? Uh, how is marketing talking to sales? How are marketing and sales talking to finance? How is the the team that's delivering the product and service? How are they communicating back? That's the one of the biggest breakdowns. And we'll do a, another training uh, in this quarter where we dive into the three business models or business structures and which one is really ideal for your for your business so that data and communication flow efficiently. And then the second thing is identify your, not only your target market, uh, but refining your marketing strategy. So much can be accomplished in business. If you have a good marketing strategy, who are you trying to sell to? What are you saying to them? And then how are you getting in front of them to, to make those sales happen? So the second phase is the fortification phase. This is where most of you on this call right now are at. You're in that fortification stage, or you may be between the uh, foundation of fortification, where if you've got if you've got revenue and you've done at least seven figures in revenue, uh, if you're more than a few years old, uh, if you're a very new business and you you may not even be at a million yet, so you're still in that foundation phase. But once you cross that seven figures, that first million, and you you're consistently doing that, so you're doing a hundred thousand. I guess that would be eighty three thousand a month or more. Then you're between the foundation phase and the fortification phase. And this is where it becomes about strengthening your business in preparation for growth. Most businesses, they they operate in one of two phases. Either they're trying to, usually they're trying to grow, just we want to grow as fast as possible, get as many new clients, as much revenue as possible without an understanding of revenue versus cash versus the type of revenue and how you're tracking that, all the financial stuff that... Uh, Tim and Heather get into, but they want to grow, but they haven't really optimized anything in the business. And then some more sophisticated business owners will think of it in terms of optimization. And then we're going to scale. Then we're going to look for exponential growth. But in reality, if you're only looking at optimizing and then scaling, you're skipping over. You're, you're taking a much higher level view of it. If you're an enterprise business, sure, it's optimization and scaling. And that's what you hear the C-level, the C-suite talk about. But under the C-suite, the VPs, the directors, they're not talking just in terms of optimization and scaling. They're talking about specifically what it takes to do that. There's a more granular view. And this is one of the disconnects that I see with a lot of the business experts. Uh, some who are legit, they built big businesses, but they talk at this high level. But when you're a startup, when you're a sub $10, $15 million business, you are you shouldn't even be worried about scaling. You've got to build a really solid business and fortify Otherwise, trying to scale will crush your business. It's like I'm five, I'm five, 
how to say five eleven, but my wife laughed at me. Five ten and a half, <laughs> five ten and three quarters, and uh, I'm I'm right now uh, fortifying my my body, my health. So I take uh, nine different supplement pills every day. I'm on vitamin D supplements. I go outside. I do grounding, um, train martial arts training three times a week, weight training four times a week, and I, I continue to build my strength. So I can. I mean, at my peak right now, I, I'll deadlift 250. I'll bench press 205. My son, who is, he's a big kid. He's the biggest 10-year-old that you'll probably see. He can't do anything near that because his frame, his foundation is not built to sustain what I can sustain. So you think of your business in the same same way. These growth stages are really about maturity of your business. If you're in the fortification stage, you've got a baby business. Now it might be a 10-year-old baby, but it's still an infant of a business in the fortification stage is where we're looking to build strength. And that means we need to look for consistently. We need to celebrate the wins, but look for the weaknesses. We need to focus on how do we build a strong team? How do we optimize our, the systems that we built in the foundation stage and for optimizing systems, may be upgrading when you're a startup, you're, you're trying to hit that first million. You don't have a CRM. You don't really need, and I emphasize need a CRM. It's good to have, but you don't need a CRM. You don't need to pay a few hundred dollars uh, for a CRM. As you grow, then you need it. Then you want to put that in place. So optimizing systems, sometimes that's upgrading systems, and then stabilizing your cash flow. When you're in that you know sub million or sub five, your revenue can be up and down. There's no consistency. And the reason why is because you haven't Optimize the systems or upgraded systems to create that consistency. Up into, depending on your industry, again, you can get to three to five, three to eight million. Um, more than that, if you're, especially if you're in a like construction, where you get big projects, big jobs, but it's still fluctuating because it's all based on organic and you chasing it and you have no systems. So you're not generating consistent leads through a system. Running ads, that's a system. A system, in this case, fortifying is building systems that are. Uh, include automation. It runs on its own. So really think of it in in this phase. Uh, Tim actually said something today. We were doing a content shoot and he brought up uh, just, I, I don't know if it was off the top or if it's something that he said in the past. This was the first time I've heard it, but he, he said this concept. Uh, I'm actually let him explain it. You dropped it in, in our in our Slack channel, but Tim, you explain it so I don't mess it up. Yeah, your your business is like an engine. And at first you get a two cylinder, you, you, you don't have a lot of power. But as you upgrade and you go through the, the process of building it, you get to add cylinders in order to eventually get up to what is a V12, right? The best engine in the world. Or you could argue that it's a V6 in line from BMW, but hey, we could argue that point later. But realistically, as you're talking about your business, you're building the foundations and you're adding cylinders and you're adding the pistons, you're adding the gears in order to produce higher output. But as you're building in that system, the first time you add in a cylinder, it's going to sputter. Ultimately, you have to add two systems at a time, right? Your business has the, the logic will be built into the business of what do you have to add into the business all at the same time in order for it to work. Again, if you've got five departments, you will likely have to add headcount into every single department as you're going through the scaling process at the exact same time and through the clear data you will actually see that. What does it take to currently serve your 100 clients and produce the million dollars in revenue? Well, if you want to do 2 million, logically, you have to double the size of your business. However, through variance analysis and through efficiency studies, we can actually most likely see that you will probably be able to have some more efficiency improvement. So you actually won't need to add a full number of headcount into all of your departments. But you have to do that type of data um, in order to clearly outline what exactly is needed to truly hit that double digit growth or triple digit growth in this case. And as we analyze your business through the logic or the analogy of your engine, it really is identifying what do we have to tack on in order to grow and hit more output? Because that's what we're after in your business is additional output that we can either reinvest back into the business and go buy two extra cylinders or add additional pistons or it's through additional distributions in the business and we have just higher horsepower output from the business or just through exhaust. We'll work on the analogy. <laughs> no, but that's, it's good. 
And, and, you know, thinking of it like an engine, I've always thought of marketing and sales like an engine. In fact, our CRM that we we put clients on to help manage all of their um, their marketing is we call it marketing engine because that's truly what it is. So at the fortification stage, part of what's necessary for growth and managing growth, not just creating, but at every stage of of your business, you have to you create and then you have to manage. You create and then manage. That's why this cycle is not, okay, we went from foundation, now we're in fortification. Well, every time you go to a new level, you have to go back to foundation for that department, for that team, for that team member, for that offering. And you fortif you have to build the foundation of it and then you fortify. So at the fortification stage, I know something that Kirk would mention is, do you have an onboarding process? How are you developing and training people? And I'll let him speak to that specifically. What what are those key elements at the fortification stage that need to be in place on the people development and leadership side? Yeah, so I mean, the the biggest thing is really, how are you positioning your people to be successful? So everything that we do is really about creating an environment by design. So a lot of times, and I actually talked to a, a group earlier this week, um, that their their idea of onboarding was kind of the default mode of he gives him three pieces of paper that have some rough ideas of some process around their sales process says hey i'm going to come back to you in a couple of hours and see what you have figured out this happens five consecutive days and that is your onboarding so one of those things intent in communicates that there's not a whole lot of intention behind us bringing you on. We don't even know what you're going to do. We just know that we need a body. So I refer to this as throwing warm bodies at cold seats. And I think we've all been guilty of doing that. It doesn't work at a very high success rate. So in this fortification phase, really taking kind of the dovetail in process and really creating what are those touch points along the journey of that first 30 days that really is going to impact that new team member, really communicating that you aren't just a, an afterthought, but we put a lot of forethought into not only why you're here, but what you're going to experience when you're here. So thinking through the, the summit and that, that content, we really want to take them on kind of a guided tour of what it's like to be here. And that onboarding really starts with the job post and that conversation continues throughout their time of onboarding into getting them to uh, an ongoing one-on-one -on -one conversation. We talk about relationships a lot around here and it, it doesn't just stop with your customers. It really does, should permeate within your four walls and those should be the strongest of all your relationships in your business is the ones that are caring for your business, stewarding your business, and then taking care of your clients out of the energy and effort that they've put into building what you're building with them. Again, all this is done through those first three foundational pieces of mission, vision, and core values. So... I want to share this principle with you. This is another reason why the fortification is so important. Um, there's a principle called Price's Law. It's actually a, a law more than a, it's a principle. And it says that 50% of any, uh, the 50% of the production of any domain produced is produced by the square root of that domain. The domain meaning 50% of the production from any team, any set of offerings, any set of ads. 50% of the production comes from the square root of that. So with that, I'll break that down. If you have nine salespeople, if you have nine ad campaigns, 50% of the production is going to come from three of those. So as you scale, this is why systems and automation and having that engine becomes so important because the more you grow, the less each person is producing. That's why you'll see in big sales teams, you have a few people who really drive the bulk of the revenue. And that's why most salespeople don't make a ton of money. And it, it sales in particular is such a high turnover because that's just the nature of when you start scaling, you, you can have, you need the systems in place also on the, the HR side. So you can recruit really great candidates, but you're going to have to go through a lot to find the really quality ones. And the better systems you have in place, the better you're set up to scale because 
as you get the systems in place, the growth can become more rapid and you need people to support that. You need infrastructure. You need to have lots of cash on hand so that if you outgrow your space, you can go and get a new space and not be stuck and have your growth limited. And that means part of it is you need to be able to anticipate what the growth is going to be and what the necessary actions are to support the growth you're going into. And that means being able to think at least two quarters ahead in your business, which is in the next stage that we're going to talk talk to. Uh, but to wrap up this stage, key actions to take, review your team's roles and responsibilities and ensure that you have the right people in the right seats. You get the right talent in place. And conversely, where is it lacking? Where are you lacking leadership support? Um, and that could be either you hire internally or I was talking to a client today uh, that just signed up for to work with us. They have great people and they have a great stakeholder running the business. The, you have the, the CEO and he has a great director of operations and that director, director of operations has a lot of experience in much bigger companies. So he knows how to get where they want to go. But he recognizes because of his experience, he doesn't have an executive team that can support that. So they hired us to come and be that executive team to provide that additional support because they're thinking ahead because of the experience and there's there's wisdom there. The second key action is identify the processes that need to be optimized. In other words, just ask yourself one simple question. If I were to double my business next month, where and what would break? That's where you got to start. What would break? Who would break? Who is at capacity? If you've got people operating at 90% capacity, it's time to think about either hiring more people or creating better systems. And that's another question. Do you hire more people or do you create more efficiencies? Do you get another body in there or do you create a better system so that that one person can produce more? These are the kind of questions that from experience, you start to learn how to ask those questions. I just want to give you guys the questions to think through because you have a lot more benefit in asking the right questions, even if you're not sure which one is the right questions. At least you have a, a menu of questions to ask. Does that make sense? Everyone tracking so far? All right. Yeah, Kirk said, don't break your people with your process. Uh, we've all had experience uh, on the All True team of being in organizations where it was super process heavy and too much process can actually take your people away from production. It can actually undermine the, uh, the production that they should be focused on the customer service because they're too focused on production. My personal philosophy, um, and uh, I'd love Heather to speak to this. If depending on your role, you should be spending 80% of your time producing results and only 20% doing uh, process like administration and the processes really are are meant to facilitate the production so look at your team and ask the question where is most of their time spent is it in executing a process that is administrative just needs to be done that doesn't directly drive a result or is it 80 percent in production and the processes simply facilitate that heather did you have any additional insights on that actually we would more like 90 to 10 to be quite fair because admin work should not take up a ton of your time. Because again, if you are creating the right process, and this depends on the industry too, but if you're creating enough process, there shouldn't be a ton of documentation if you have efficient systems. Um, the one thing I would add to this is that understand those who manage the process or processes should not want And I'll give you an example. Um, I recently worked with a company where they had someone in accounting who They've been a beller their entire life, so they're they're creating invoices for the company. But then all of a sudden, they have no idea where this, these invoices go when when it's done. So, for instance, like they do an invoice and it goes to accounts receivable, and the clients go ahead and now we pay the bill, and that's how you get your cash, right? Well, they had no idea of the why behind what they were doing, so they were just do, following the process based on what the instructions they're given, and that's all they did. And so when they ran into exceptions or they ran into credit memos where they had to create credit memos for the client, they had no idea how to create them because they're like, well, what's the point? This is my instructions. I don't steer from those instructions because they didn't understand the why behind what they're doing. Same thing with service-based people. If you're out in the field and you use a particular product or a particular brand for parts or you know whatever you're doing, um, 
they have to understand why do we do that? Why is it our way of doing something versus another way of doing something? It's because obviously you want them to understand what at the at their core values are, what your differentiator brand, and again, why the process exists in the first place. And if there is a gap in that process, they will start to think uh, through the overall process. Oh, this this is not a normal every process that happens. Just accept the rule. How do I think when there's an exception to the rule? Because those who don't truly understand the why behind what they're doing, they just go through kind of like this drone brain where they just kind of process, they're kind of autopilot, they don't ask critical thinking questions. Whereas so those that understand the why and care about your business will do a criti- uh, brain tree decision process, critical thinking skill in the brain to say, huh, if this happens, I should raise the alarm. If this happens, I should ask questions as to why, because it doesn't make sense. You want those people in your business because they will help to further your business along and make you more efficient. If you don't have those kind of people pushing back on you, if they see something that's not efficient, ask yourself why. Is it oftentimes I've seen business owners are they push back on new ideas because they just think their way is the best way to do things, or the business the the employee just kind of checked out, and at that point that's an even bigger problem in their hands. Yep, hundred percent. I'm getting people texted me, hey, can I get on the call? So send out the link. All right. Um. So stage, oh, Asha, go ahead. Rephrase that in another way, Asha. Sorry, I accidentally muted you. Yeah, so along with this process, because I'm, as you're talking about this, I'm thinking about my team right now. I feel like Matt and I have worked really hard these last two years in building out our processes, but kind of going into that analysis paralysis, I feel like we have so many processes that we've really put into place that our team doesn't go back to looking for the answers. They're just so more inclined to say, oh, where do I find this? It's like, did you check the client folder? Did you check our ClickUp process? Like we're, we're kind of asking them, like, did you go through this process? So I guess like, how do you find that balance between, you know, stick to what our process is versus thinking outside the box and think for yourself versus like the automation where they're just like, I don't find it here immediately. Like, how do you, I guess, like train that into people without necessarily also over indulging them for them to think way, way outside of it where they're, they're doing things where they're not clearing it by you either. Like, how do you find that balance? So I'd like to, anytime that we have issues that I run into, um, in the business, I was asked team members, if you have a problem, you need to bring me three solutions and a recommendation to that solution. And that's what we run with. Um, Not saying that we want to run with the recommendation, but I want to understand what the recommendation is. That gets them thinking, I brought a problem, I have to have a solution in the back end, which tells me I'm gonna go and search for an answer first before I come to you because I need to come up with solutions. Um, Additionally, if they do come to you and say, where do I find this? You can go back and say, well, where would you look for it? Where do you think it would be? Putting the questions back on them and having them make the decision. Because again, if they're having to be the one to get the resource anyway, they're going to eventually stop asking if they don't get the response they're wanting. So the question I have for you is that when this happens, do you guys typically answer the questions on the spot or lead them to their, the resource? Or do you push it back on them? Um, with my team, I do ask the question, did you check the client folder? Um, A perfect example was uh, we were doing something with one of our assets and she had asked, hey, can you send me the the font files for this? And I said, did you check the asset folder first? And she's like, Mm -hmm. oh, I found it after like probably a few minutes going back into the folder to look for it. So I do ask. I try Mm -hmm. not to be rude because I know also in text message, it probably doesn't come off like pleasant. But I do ask, like, did you check this base first? And then they either say, oh, I found it, or yes, I already did that. And then I ask the next question. Makes sense. And so I would ask the question, do they understand where all the reasons are at? Because there's two things. You see, they're kind of a, I didn't think to look there type thing, which if you're busy, it just kind of, especially if you're young, it's very typical to do that because they they don't know how to kind of think for themselves. Um, If they don't know where things exist, show them and give them a breakdown and make sure that you're drives incredibly clean and organized so they understand where to find things uh if that's all in place the question i'd be having is okay 
what what gets you to, what makes you think this way is it just a lack of um drive or just a lack of critical thinking skill if it's a lack of critical thinking skill that can be trained uh, to a certain extent if it's a lack of drive you have a bigger problem in your hands with that employee because you can't really teach drive unfortunately i mean i think you nailed it uh if they're younger they're both both my team members are under the 26 mark so the critical thinking um, doesn't necessarily first kick in until they start talking with us. And then they're like, oh, that makes sense. So I'll, I'll keep working on that with them. Yeah. Additional conversation is what's going to drive that. It's having, again, I think Kirk has done, uh, does a great job with this, is the coaching sessions. That's really what the one-on-ones are for, in addition to that, is to get them that, get, get them that coaching, get them the frame of mind, and help them understand, here's how I want you to think in a day-to-day job so you can be independent. With that, though, again, if you give them the ability to be independent and empower them, just make sure, again, they understand how things should be done the way that you want them to be done, but give them some freedom to do what they want. And I think if you give them the more freedom you give them, the more they'll be independent from you. If you are constantly uh, coming back behind them, checking their work, asking how things are done, you know, it's you're going to get exactly that they're going to wait and ask you for everything because you're you're holding so tightly on the process that's really good and i'll i'll, I'll add this as, as well um in in being in different environments that had no process to too too much process um i think of a principle that we uh, heather and i use with our kids and we tell them this whether it's uh, uh religion politics whatever we're not going to tell you what to think we are going to teach you how we think so that you are learning how to think. And when you're building process, uh, we did this, we've been intentional about this with all true partners. Um, we we're not building process where we build, I don't want to say we build very little process, but we only build essential process. If something needs to be done the same way, every time build a process for it. If, if it's something that we don't have to have a process documented for, then don't do it. Um, because then we're, we're handcuffing people. And like Heather said, you're, you're not allowing the creativity, but also process tells someone what to think. And the more process you have, the more you're telling people what to think. So only create process when it's absolutely essential to, to maintain consistency. Otherwise, creates um, like we have a, a, a toolkit of recommended way, best practices, uh, which is a recommended way of doing something. But it's not necessarily a process. It's a document that teaches you, here's the best practice, and here's how to think through this. And then if you combine that with what Heather was saying with the 131, you know, if you've got a problem, bring me three solutions, um, then you're going to have a lot more effectiveness. And you're going to very, very quickly weed out the non-thinkers. Like, if they can't think for themselves, then that, you know, you got to make other decisions. Boom. So, um, stage three. We talked through the foundation stage. We talked through the fortification stage. Uh, now the the found the foresight stage. This is where this is really a transition stage. This is uh, this is a critical stage. This is the stage where you you are building the things into your business, and you're maturing your business to the point where it can grow exponentially and really unlimited. And again, this is the cycle you you go through. You don't go all the way through to fortune and then you're done. You cycle through at a macro level at a micro level uh, between departments and offers. But the foresight stage is exactly what it sounds like. Our philosophy at All Two Partners is we focus on 180-day uh, execution because the world just changes too fast. Having a one-year execution plan, you can have targets for a year, targets for uh, goals for three years, and then vision for five to 10 years. But your execution, what are we actually going to do, shouldn't really go past Six, uh, six months, so two quarters, because so many things can change within that time frame. If you're an enterprise level business and you're operating in a much bigger way where you know a big ship, uh, it, it takes more effort and more time to turn a big ship, unless you're an enterprise business, meaning you are 75 million plus up to about 50 million, you're considered a um, small business. So small would be uh, up to about 50, 50 to about half a billion is more mid-market and then beyond that is really enterprise so enterprise companies they really they shape the market they don't just react to it what the decisions they make 
dictate what the rest of us are doing because they have that kind of pool. We don't. So we're planning six months out. So we're nimble and able to adjust. The foresight stage is where you start implementing the, the things in your business that allow you to anticipate future challenges and opportunities. So your business is at the stage where you want to focus is on long-term planning and doing your market analysis to stay ahead of industry trends. So where are things going in your industry? And let's look ahead. How do we plan for the next six months? So right now you should be planning for, for Q4 through Q1 of next year. And then at the end of this quarter, December going into January, you should be planning through the summer. So really every 90 days, you should be updating your, your 180 day, what we call a 180 day business action plan. So it's like a, on a rolling 90 days. We plan for six for six months of execution, but we're doing like a rolling 90 days. So we're always, if something happens in the moment, if an opportunity happens, for example, we're in Q4 of an election year. January 20th and really November is going to start to shift things because people react differently. Right now, if you're in a, if you're a grocery store, you're making bank on toilet paper because Costco uh, is, is selling out uh, we have a family group text message and the family saying, hey, go buy toilet paper because people are going crazy and they're buying it all up. It's like March 2020, you know, beginning of COVID. Toilet paper is about to become a currency. So if you need to make some investments, uh, you might want to invest in, you know, Charmin. Get that get that Charmin money. <laughs> but these are the kind of things that can impact your business. Now, what does toilet paper have to do with your business? What does what do the seaports have to do with your business? Nothing. But they impact the market, and the market impacts consumer behavior. And consumer behavior is what directly impacts your business to play currency. <laughs> so you've got to look at these things. Uh, depending on who gets elected, taxes will go up or taxes will go down. Policies will change. Priorities will change. As a business, businesses are the are the the foundation of our entire country. That's where money is spent, primarily with small businesses. That's where it flows. If taxes go up, that impacts your business. How are you going to pivot and plan? So you may have a plan right now through uh, end of Q1, but come November 5th, whoever gets elected, you may have to change your plan. You may have to adapt. And the reason why we put systems in place where you have your data, you can look at historical market data, industry data, what are the trends, what happened last election? How do these, I mean, Harvard Business Journal, uh, Deloitte, all of this data is available. You start to leverage these things, including the data within your own business, and you start looking out and asking the question, if this happens, here's what we do. If this happens, here's what we do. And that's how you build a business that can weather any storm. Businesses that after, during an election or after an election fall apart or uh, a recession is because they weren't prepared. They weren't looking far, far enough out. When you have a plan, it's easier to adapt than when you don't have a plan. And when you get to the place where you are looking at your own data, for example, we have a, a client we're talking to just today and we're looking at the, the marketing data. And one of the questions was, um, what should it cost us to sell this particular service? My response was, uh, in short, we don't know. We can look at industry data, but within the business itself, we don't have enough data to know what it historically has cost us. So we'll take the industry data, we use that as our starting point and then we'll execute a really solid strategy over the next 90 days. And then at day 91, we'll look back and now we'll have data to tell us what we should be paying. And we can move forward based off of that. Too many business owners, their idea of foresight is watching Fox Business News or um, MSNBC and going off of that or going off of whatever Elon's tweeting and basing their business decisions on what their competitors are doing. You've got to look at a micro view your local market, your competitors, and a macro view. What's happening in the greater marketplace? What's happening in the world? And plan for your business, because that's why you built your business. You built it to be, uh, you know, you built not to be a speedboat where we can go real fast and have a lot of fun before the ride's over. You built it to be an arc. Let's get our people in here and keep ourselves safe no matter what happens when the storm comes. And there's always a storm coming. We may be going into a really tough season, or a really uh, prosperous season. But one thing that's true is when the market gets hit hard or there's a recession, 
regardless of the market, somebody is always winning. And the people who are always winning in a down market, in a recession, are the people who are prepared and had historical data from the market, from their industry, and from their business, where they knew, if we change this, this, and this, we can still win. Somebody has already stocked up on toilet paper because they saw this coming. When the report came out last week that the uh, the seaport workers were going to, 50% of them were going to go on strike, somebody was already preparing because they knew what happened uh, during COVID. So... Key actions to take at this stage, number one, conduct a market forecast. Start identifying uh, future opportunities and risks. Start looking for uh, what those trends are. Look historical and then look forward. Keep plugged into um, who's talking about business. Look at the big players, the enterprise level companies. What are they doing? What decisions are they making? I pay attention when I when I watch the news, who's selling stocks and where are they selling them? What are they talking about? Where's the focus shifting? And I ask the question, what's that an indicator of? Should I should I do something about that? Uh, and then second, adjust your business strategy based on those industry trends. And again, these are these are this is not an exhaustive list, but we want to tell you how to think. Start looking at your business and ask the question: If Donald Trump wins, how will that impact the economy and business? If Harris wins, how will that impact the economy and business? And start preparing for both scenarios. Because one of the greatest, um, the things that impacts business the most is what happens in at the at the uh, government level that all trickles down. Taxes change and we get inflation. Guess what? You, what, what your salary, the salary you're paying your employees no longer is as valuable to them because it doesn't buy as much. So they have to start making considerations. And that's where you've got to think about how do you shift your culture? How do you add additional value that maybe isn't in the form of additional salary, but how do you provide additional support? And the final stage, the fortune stage. This is where businesses get to have fun. This is where, uh, I know Tim has done uh, a lot with clients in this space where they've got money to do things with. Uh, we have a, a long-term plan. You know, our, within our three-year plan is part of our growth. And really within a year, uh, if we hit our targets, which we we're confident we will, it'll be growing all true partners through some strategic acquisitions for certain services that we that we want to bring in house. So our plan is we're looking at how do we how much money do we need to have to have the structure we need so we can leverage it and then grow in the way that we intend to so we can better serve our clients. And it's all based on that. How do we provide more value, better serve all of our clients? So we're starting to look toward that. The foresight is how you get to the fortune. So you plan for that fortune stage of growth before you get there. You start looking at your business and you set your targets, you set your goals based on that. And at the fortune stage, this is where your, your business achieves exponential growth and profitability, not just growth in revenue, top line, but bottom line revenue, both in profit, total dollars uh, in profit and profitability, the percentage of your revenue that is profit. You want to see both of those grow. Um, Tim, do you have anything extra to add on that? Because this is a conversation we were having recently with the client, and I'll, I'm sure you've got some some additional insights. No, I think you summed it up perfectly. I think the only thing I'd add is, realistically, when you summarize fortune, it's this is the reason you get exponential growth is because you can go through acquisitions or you can add several components into your business all at once. Again, in the earlier stages. When you're looking at growing, you're you're not tacking on new revenue streams all at once or multiple new revenue streams all at once. You're doing one at a time. You're taking a baby step and you're testing the waters in the fortune stage because you have enough margin in the business that you can take greater risks. Oftentimes you see that exponential growth because you can take more risks at once and leverage the risk taking capability that your business has in order to see additional growth in the foundational stage. And the fortification says what you're really looking at doing is taking step and growing and trying to grow and then being consistent in that growth. And then as you look at profitability increases now through the foresight or the predictability stage, now, you know, because I'm doing X, I can expect 10 to 20 percent growth in my business. And now I have more cash flow or free cash flow in the business to take greater risks.
And so that's ultimately why the for the fortune stage is where we get to have a lot more fun because there's just more, there's extra wealth in the business that we can strategize and how do we leverage that in order to take even greater risks. Yeah, and at this stage, your focus becomes not just growing the business, but now maximizing profits, expanding your market share, and then in your worksheet, there's probably I think there's a type one there, but the last one is creating lasting impact and a legacy building. So I think of legacy building as uh, this is one of my AJisms. I write these little phrases for myself to remember these principles: build something worth being known for, but leave something worth being remembered for. So you think about how does your how will your business either your business itself outlast you or the impact the the le financial leverage you you create how will that uh, outlast you? And for some of you, uh, we were talking to a client recently uh, that that just came on as a as a client, and what we love about them is he wants to make a lot of money, grow to nine figures, so he can take that money and then use it to save animals uh, in the state where he lives. He's he's on the coast and he wants to save animals. He sees a lot of things happening that he wants to make an impact in, but also he supports at-risk youth and he wants to do more of that. So he his impact is already planned out. His business is just the vehicle to get him the resources, the financial resources to do those things. So when you think about that, that's a bigger why. That's a bigger motivation than I want to, I want to jet. Like, we were talking about this and uh, I mentioned to Tim, like, yeah, I, I, the idea of a jet is cool. And to my surprise and excitement, he said, well, at some point, a jet's going to be necessary. We're traveling and we're meeting with clients. We have to get one. And I said, okay, if you say so. All right, I'll approve that. So, you, you but our, what we care about is the impact. How many, how much money can we give away? How many people can we help? Yeah, Matt, we'll have matching jets and we'll race. <laughs> Let's see if my jet can beat your jet. <laughs> so, yeah, at this stage, it's about profit. It's about market share. How do you how do you gain more ground so you can make a greater impact? And let it be driven by impact. Uh, we were doing a content shoot today, and one of the the videos that I shot, uh, I talked about growing. And there's two ways you can grow. You can grow either for profit, or you can grow for purpose. If you grow for profit. It's just making more money. You don't even have to be ethical to do that. But if you grow for purpose or by purpose, or like we like to say, scaling on purpose, you're growing so you can do something that is outside of yourself. It's bigger than yourself. So when I think about having a jet, I don't really care. I used to want a Ferrari. I don't care. I, I'm Now I just want a really nice custom pickup, which incidentally, the one I want will cost as much as a Ferrari. But more than that, I want to give money away. I want to be be financially uh, in a place where my children and my children's children and their children, there's an Adam's empire and there's enough to take care of them. Fortunately, my wife and myself and uh, some, some of my other siblings who are older, I'm the oldest of eight, the four of us who were grown, we we're all in a position where uh, when my dad passed a few years ago, we were able to take care of my mom. My mom moved in with us. She didn't have to worry about any bills. Uh, it's just her phone, her car but everything else was pretty much was taken care of for her. I want to be able to do more of that. So that's the fortune stage. So key actions to take at this stage is evaluating your profit margins. Identify opportunities for increased efficiency, paying off that debt, taking money that's going out, keeping it in-house, keeping it in, in profit, and then planning for long-term impact uh, by creating a philanthropy stat strategy. So... Another marketing strategy is giving to the community. Just having that presence and giving back to the community. When you put goodwill into the community, and this is a branding concept, you put goodwill out into the market, it comes back to you in the form of revenue. And when you do this strategically, you can make a massive impact. So remember, this is a cycle. So if we look back at that, the uh, the illustration, the diagram at the top of the worksheet, you see it's it's cyclical. We're going through all of these. So even though you, you're in between, most of you are between the foundation stage and the fortification stage, you want to be thinking about foresight. You want to be thinking about the fortune stage and creating vision, not execution plan, but vision further down the line while focusing on the next 180 days of execution so you can get there. So in your business, ask the question, what are you focused on? 
Are you focused on the right activities that match the stage you're at? And at the bottom of the worksheet, there's a reflection section for you to ask these questions. So first question is, what stage do you think your business is currently in? And just, just circle it. The second question is, what's the biggest challenge you're facing in this stage? And then what's one action you can take this week to move forward closer, one step closer to the next stage? So we'll open it up now. Hopefully, let me know in the chat. Was was that valuable, that training on the four uh, stages of the growth cycle? Was that valuable for you? Was it helpful? Yep. Ash says, great matter of where we're at now. So here's your next steps. Uh, after after this call, review your, your answers and really think through those areas where yeah, that you can explore further. Some of you are already clients working with us. So those are questions you can bring to us. We can strategize around that. And then um, start planning out your next move. Where does the key focus need to be in order for you to, to really get ahead and move to those next steps? But I'll shut up now. I've talked long enough. You guys have gotten value. I want to open it up for any additional questions, insights that we can provide to you guys through the rest of the call. Or even just a, a takeaway. What was a key takeaway just from this, this training tonight? I got a key takeaway. Um, you know, we, we go through a lot of this, you know, we talk about the different phases and everything. You know, I think uh, one thing for me is, is awareness of a subject versus, you know, knowledge of a subject, you know? So when we're going through and looking at our business and we're, we're looking at different things and understanding what a KPI is or even a process and having awareness of it, sometimes we, just because we have awareness, we think we already know it. We tend, we tend to move faster than, than what we should uh, versus gaining a deeper understanding of whatever that subject is. And I think that being, uh, um, Coming from a different group that was, you know, uh, very fast on quick on move forward, move forward, move forward process, you know, and just kind of, you know, try to push you along uh, creates confusion. So I think, uh, you know, for me, it's about going back to those foundational stages and really diving into those areas and making sure I'm not just aware, but uh, gaining knowledge of that, understanding how that really uh, flows into the business and where we can yeah. improve in certain areas. Awesome. Yeah, that it's I, I love that you say that it's one thing to be aware. It's another thing to really focus on on the execution of it. And that's why on these calls, we will get real strategic if we're talking through strategy. And if we're talking through tactics, we'll dive into the actual tactic. How do you do it? Because the goal is that you whether you're a current client or not, you leave this call with something that you can actually execute that will help move you forward. And this is what when we talk about um, impact. Part of our philosophy at Allergy Partners is value first, value always. So on these calls, we'll give more value than a lot of coaching program, business coaching programs give. And that's our, our goal because if someone isn't ready to work with us, on average, there's a, and this is studies that have been done, there's a Dunbar study that says before someone would do business with you, and it depends on your price point, especially if it's a on the higher end or it's a longer term commitment, depending on the financial and level of investment and the, the commitment of time and energy, Someone needs to spend on average seven hours engaging with you. So this is why we'll do one day, two day events. If we plan to to make an offer to bring people into our ecosystem to work with us. And the reason why is they need their questions answered. They need enough familiarity with you to go through whether they're conscious or subconscious through their, their questions, their concerns, get those answers uh, through the engagement with you in order to make a decision to do business. After seven hours, consuming seven hours of content, and Google has a similar study. Uh, they they have a seven, uh, a seven, eleven, and four. Someone needs to consume seven hours of content uh, in four four different platforms across eleven different touch points. So they they're engaging with you eleven different times on four different platforms and consuming seven hours of content. Seven, eleven, four. That principles based on all their billions and billions of data points there. I mean, what is it? Terabytes? What's bigger than an octobyte of data that they understand what it takes for someone to make a, a buying decision. So that's why we do these calls. We're just going to give away a ton of value because we believe if we help you for free, then you may want to engage with us in a deeper way. Uh, Kirk, I see you're unmuted. Did you have something to add? 
Yeah, I was just going to echo um, a little bit of what Logan was talking about, and we've we've talked about it, and we're actually using it, but it's called the transformational learning technique or theory. Um, but really, it's it's exactly what you mentioned. It's not just rushing through it because being aware of something is not enough when you're wanting to master a concept. There's no major league baseball player that's ever gotten to the plate by just thinking about playing baseball. They've spent many hours in the cage where nobody sees them to get to a place to where when people do see them, it comes across very natural as if they were born to do it, but they were trained to do it. They trained long and hard behind closed doors to do it. The transformational learning theory is really all about doing it with somebody, doing it for them, doing it with them, and then allowing them to do it and then coaching them along that process to where they can gain mastery until they don't need the coach necessarily to coach them through it. They'll just look at those fine tuning tweaks as they master that process or the duplication of the process into the next generation of employee. So you're absolutely right. I just want to kind of reiterate what you said is literally what's going on in the background of the training and development pieces behind everything that we roll out to our clients. So I think it's it's great to, to hear the alignment that you want more than just being aware of what you don't know, but you actually wanna to know to a level to where you can have competency in that area. Love it. All right, any final 